Thank you very much, Program Director David Munyai, and my fellow panelists, Sfuso uh, Mashangu and uh, uh, my friend from the ADF. After not seeing each other for a long time, I'm glad to see you now. I'm back in the space that I was moved temporarily. <laughs> Uh, Welcome back. As a deputy chairperson of the ANC International Relations now. Welcome. And uh, so I will see more of you often, and they will definitely engage on matters. And also thanks to Minsemi, my daddy. Uh, we used to belong to some revolutionary house. Uh, and, uh, and as leaders, uh, young leaders came with that energy. I was there, and uh, but... I had to leave Parliament quicker, and as soon as I left, they also left to, us, to go somewhere else. <laughs> I'm glad to see you here now. And uh, the former uh, president of, of, of In Absentia now, Amik Fakiv from Mauritius, who spoke earlier. Can I do a disclaimer? Uh, Ambassador uh, Mohammed uh, Besset, otherwise I will not be able to enter. Western Sahara again, if I don't acknowledge your, your presence here. What happened is that I just want to make a disclaimer. I was told I'm coming here to be an audience. So unlike Magdalene with such a huge book, I think you spend days and weeks preparing your input. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I speak out of turn, please blame the organizers. <laughs> that they invited me, enticed me to come as an, as part of you, the audience. And then who are supposed to be sitting here is the Deputy Minister Alvin Bodis. And I just said, hey, man, I'm sitting here, where are you? I'm just occupying your seat. He said, hey, look here, there was misorganization, unfortunately. Uh, the engagement with the office did not conclude, and therefore he thought this event is no longer there. And that is why you cannot even join online because you didn't prepare anything. So I came to you having listened to the, that's why I insisted, uh, program director, that let them speak first because they were already on the poster advertised as speakers so that I can hear what they were saying. Now I know their views and I can just respond to some, not all because of, of time. I also did indicate to the organizers that I'll be leaving four o'clock half past four because I have another event in Pretoria. So I just had to squeeze this one in honor of Moksin, my friend here, and then quickly dash out. But I'll want to be as brief so that I can interact with a few comments that might come from the floor or on the platform. With that being said, let me therefore say that uh, Africa is the richest continent with the poorest people and I think that's my opening remark. We are the richest continent but look at poverty and the people that are poor on this very rich continent. As you know that the minerals uh, complex, they dig, extract and then they all go to the port, port they go elsewhere to go and create jobs there because the primary to just extracting them is your primary activity. You take it as raw as is, whether it's timber, it's minerals under the soil or any other, we just export them. And then they come back as finished goods, three times the price, four times the price. Only those who can afford them for the majority can even enjoy the very fruits of their own minerals, timber, or anything. So that's the challenge that uh, Africa is still changing. I don't know when you say, Kwame uh, Nkrumah, you are now beginning to doubt his intention there. Only for that resolution, two of that declaration. Of that declaration. Yeah, that page 533. Okay. Of that book. Yeah. yeah, but otherwise, the intention was to really to decolonize Africa to liberate it, uh, they free it, and freedom schemes differently. Others were negotiated, others, it was uh, through the barrel of a gun until the victory itself. 
and, and the systems that Africa inherited are different. Uh, Western influence, majority of them, very few of them with African value systems. And I think uh, Magdalene just said it that our African value system is lost. He doesn't see it uh, because we just inherited uh, whoever was our colonizer and then we modeled, uh, replaced them as the governors to be the governing. And, and, and But obviously there was an improvement in some of the constitutions over time. That's why other countries had to go the first republic, the second republic, and the third republic. Mm -hmm. And there's a call in South Africa that maybe we need the second republic. republic yeah. I do not know. So that we debate, debate uh, that. we'll have to debate. And then the intellectuals and academia here must, must really bring it to the fore. Uh, whether indeed, and I thought Eddie Maluga, one of your academic, is already confronted the issue. He wrote something to say we really need a second republic in South Africa. And, and, and what is it? Obviously, you will then be able to guide us. So now we have this uh, situation of Africa. And I'm going to conclude on Africa after just saying a few remarks uh, as I begin with it. Uh, the second issue that is facing Africa is the skills deficit. We are not investing enough in the skills of our children. And yet we've got the youth dividend. God just gave us youth. Too many. Too many. <laughs> we are 60% go over and towards 70% country by country. But that 60% we are not investing. Look at what the West did in the 1960s, what they call the baby boom. Yes. When those children were born, they invested in them education. And some of them are as a result of the new innovations that you see today. They were born in the 1960s, 63, 64, 65. They are now the, uh, the, the Mark Zubex of today. They are Steve Jobs of today. They are making it, they are changing the world the way it looks in terms of whatever advances of innovation. Ours, unfortunately, because we are not investing in them, they will die poor. And very soon Africa will be a continent of the aging population, which is poor. And Europe and then West uh, Americas, they became an aging population of people who had delivered a better future for their children. They live a good life. Their countries are secured. And with us, they will go into, go into that poverty. And they are going to peace on us when we are dead in our graves to say, what are you really doing? Look how we are, and then because you do not invest in us. So this dividend, God says, here it is. The Asian Tigers did invest in their own dividends at the time. Now it's the continent of Africa that is having that dividend. And we're not doing anything. And there's a challenge to the academics. I know that uh, governments also are responsible and the politicians. We really need to have that gathering of their minds and say, what is it that we're going to do before it's too late? And what skills do we need? These enjoyments of the many minerals that we can find else, nowhere else except here, we are then to begin to develop the skills that can go to go and exploit, extract, benefit, and then make them finished goods. And Africa to be an exporter of finished goods rather than an exporter of the raw materials. So if only we can then focus on education, we'll realize that goal. Without education, it means we still have to take our diamonds to India for polishing and cutting. India has really developed the skills in that. They're the best diamond cutters and, and polishers. And then, and the latest demand mineral is lithium. Uh, for the 2035 one the electrical cars. The and then for the batteries of those electrical vehicles. And where to get lithium? DRC, Zimbabwe, and the recent discoveries in Namibia. The queue of people that are running to those countries to secure every little 
mind that has uh, that rock. It's, it's so frightening. And Africans are just folding their arms and seeing it, and licenses being dished out uh, in the name of Babela, but behind Babela, uh, who does not have money because the financial capital is the biggest obstacle for, for mining. Then there are some people behind me, and then I sell the license to them, or they give me 10% and they take 90%. The batteries, where did they go? China, Germany, Canada, that is rock to go and do the battery. No skills whatsoever in Africa. No one talks about bringing the skills to where the mine is. And I think we ought to look at those things and say, unless we do so, uh, before I go to the human rights question, we are not going to achieve even that particular objective of uh, enjoying human rights. Because human rights is not just about people who are victims of war and conflict. Human rights, it's almost everything. Lack of water, lack of uh, bread on the table, lack of uh, access to the uh, sanitation facilities, latrines that are there that children are falling in. Uh, so it means we are not honoring those human rights objectives. Even by whatever little delivery that has happened, we are still far from uh, because of the, the challenges. So I think human rights has always been seen in the context of people who are victims uh, of the war and, uh, and who are victims of apartheid and the human rights lawyers emerge in bigger numbers, I think. Now there are no longer many in it last night. Uh, yeah, there are very few. There are still many. In, in the human rights? Yeah. No, it's more commercial now, yeah, and crime, yeah, and so, there's, no there's no more interest in human rights right. because we say we have arrived in South Africa. Yeah. But yeah. unfortunately, the we have arrived, there are certain things that we have not yet arrived in. Okay. So if schools do not have uh, proper sanitation facilities, you know the dangers that are there. The ill health that is going to arise. If two people still do not have access to water, they go to the river, to the dam, to pick up their water and drink it as raw as is. Mm. Then it means that human rights have been violated and these lawyers will be alive, taking us to court and then really finding a champion. Don't make us an itch coming over. I'm not making you to itch, but uh, some of the issues, because the cause in South Africa is the way to go now this nowadays. So we, we have that population that we need to, to really uh, invest in. And, 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 and then other issues of human rights will be your roads. Only 20% 20, 20 of the roads in South Africa are tarred. 80% of the roads are not tarred. And you think of the rural people, they've never seen a tar road if you have never been out of that area. Except if you go to town, the nearest town, small, medium town, then only then when you see uh, a, a tarred road. I know Western Sahara, you are still battling to get there. The day you get your freedom, those are going to be your challenges. How to bring and fast track these deliveries issues. We still unfortunately have the young people not in education, not in employment, and not in training. At the time when me and Musimi were sharing space in the revolutionary house, there were 2.5 million of them. Now there are 4 million. The number of the young people who are not in education, not in training, not in employment. They drop out of the school, uh, and I think the dropout, you can read it. Two million children enter grade one. By the time they write this, only 600,000 or 500,000, sometimes 400,000, they drop out because of the early pregnancies, their challenges in the family, social factors that contribute to their problem and so forth. So we are having four million. They are disillusioned. They are angry, they are discouraged. They no longer even look for a job because they've tried it so many times. And then because of lack of education metric, that gives you a bit of access and tertiary that should be given more. Majority of them do not even have those things. And therefore they are just a time bomb ticking in South Africa. So 
we, 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 that's also a denial of human rights on them because we have not, we are not even assisting. By the time we came up with NESFAS and other those programs, a majority of them, they were already out of the system. Because the system now only caters those who are entering now. It doesn't even look back and say, but what about those that were left uh, behind because of programs only coming in? We, we have structural challenges in our economy, and the ownership of the economy is still in the hands of the few. And uh, it's just how we are tackling it, where majority of parties differ, those that are on the left. Uh, they still differ on how. Uh, is it radical economic transformation we need? A disruptor and collapse what is there and build a new? And then those who say, no, let's build on what we found gradually, a gradualist approach. But young people are impatient. They say, no, we can't wait in a gradualist approach. You know? And therefore, we didn't have to tackle that particular structure. And you tamper with it, there's somebody, big brother, with a whip and say, you dare touch sanctions imposed. We dare touch, will have, it will affect your economy and so forth, this investment and then so forth. And those things are just going on. DEE is a sugar coat. It didn't do anything. It just enriched a few people. And that's it. They don't own that economy. They are just enjoying the benefits of being a minority shareholders in, in the majority of those things. Human rights is also lack of water, electricity. I spoke about the water. Lack of access to housing, lack of access to clinic and health. So you gave figures. Uh, but I don't know, did you count routing when you say 800,000 in routing? We, we, this government delivered 4 million houses. I don't know where those houses are, but I don't know when you say 800,000 definitely in routing. That was, that was the report by the MEC of housing level last week. Okay, so the rest of the... The, the, the three point two. They've been eaten by ANC councillors. <laughs> <laughs> Another debate for between me and you sometimes. <laughs> but obviously, we, we have delivered four million houses. We did connect people to the village with electricity, and we did not invest on the base. The investment was rolling and rolling. It was nice to see people lighting up their houses. Uh, and then when ESCOM came in, say, 1997, built the infrastructure that we are using to expand uh, was only designed for few. It's going to collapse at some point. We did not listen. We dismissed them. And you know we dismissed them. Your favorite president. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, and then they regret people, unfortunately. By the time we started to build, it was too late in a hurry and mistakes happened in the construction. Because they say it takes 50, 10 to 15 years to build one power station. Yeah. We, we wanted to build them in four years to eight years. And that is why Midupi is not struggling to go up. And that is why we see they struggling to go up. But by the day we finish them, they will give you enough capacity for many, many years to come because majority of those that we build apart, they are coming to an end of their life. And and therefore the capacity of not building in 1998 is costing us today. And that is why there's load shedding and, and, and where, where we are. But on social uh, programs and objectives we have achieved, 93% of South Africans have access to electricity. Weather is available daily besides load shedding. Those are the challenges that the municipalities now. Because their boxes are old, they are not changing them, they are not upgrading, they collapse, there's vandalization, there's theft also in a company. Where you find people with two weeks, three weeks, they are without electricity. Not because they don't have access, but because the distributor is not investing in the infrastructure. So is the case of the roads. We, cities, municipalities are not investing in the roads. Where there's a tar road, there are now potholes. In other areas, it's bath holes. In other areas, it's swimming pools. <laughs> because we did not invest in the maintenance, the upgrade, and because these roads are also getting old, we just didn't do. The infrastructure of the sanitation, leakages, sewer, spilling everywhere, 
is that level of investment. The population group we inherited in 1994 was 38 million fiscal. When we inherited South Africa, 38 million. Today was 61 million. Still reliant on the infrastructure that was built by apartheid. Mm. Which is very unsophisticated. Yeah. So we, we, we lacked that element of really investing and ensuring therefore that the base that uh, then and, uh, gives life to all this is it's, it's done. So I think with those lessons, uh, we, we will turn the corner. Uh, money is not abandoned, in abundance, unfortunately. Uh, the fiscal is constrained and uh, we just have then to find way of biasly investing back on those infrastructure issues so that we could then get out of the situation. Because the more we don't invest, the more the investment uh, of private sector in building factories and then and, and creating jobs, they will run away and then they go to the other countries. Uh, so for Africa to enjoy human rights, uh, the following have been proposed in the continent and that will be my parting remarks before I just touch a bit on Western Sahara. Uh, the Africa Agenda 2063. I think we'll, let's revisit that document, see if it does give us these uh, answers. And, uh, and, and, and I'm glad that uh, one of the panelists uh, referred to some solutions uh, that is, uh, I may shake, you did uh, refer to some solutions. But I'm just saying, let's visit these documents in the debates and see whether that document 2063, when the AU will be 100 years old, Africa we want must be exactly what I prescribed. Invest in the skills before 2063, less benefit, less on the economy, less then uh, uh, begin to invest on the infrastructure, on the social infrastructure, schools be better and everything because all the jobs will be created here and then everyone will be beginning to see the return of the investment just only on what God gave you, the dividend. If you don't do it, then 2063 come Africa will be the way it is. So the 2063 agenda, I think, is the one that I will really call to, to be one. The second other program that has been also uh, which, uh, for us to really achieve our human rights objectives is the, the issue of the, the good governance in the continent. I think some of the panelists touched on it and, uh, and the document that is a peer review on all of us is the African peer review mechanism. Look at how are we handling governance and leadership and also issues of management in those governance, whether who are there for the people or who are there for ourselves. And I think the peer review can also be guidance. We need to pursue it. There was NEPAT. I don't know what happened to NEPAT, uh, Magdalene. Mag uh, uh, Can you call me? Uh, yeah, I'm telling you what happened to NEPAT. Yeah. The blue economic print of Africa. That's how we branded it. Exactly. Yeah. And this was going to turn the economy of Africa and then we will then be competing with the most industrialized nation because it was calling for the industrialization in the continent. But still with the BRICS Bank? Well, the BRICS yeah. Bank is there. Yeah. It's there, but it's money. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's say in August when we talk about it, one we are wasting the BRICS. Okay. Yeah, in South Africa. So I think we need to then begin to say, Nepal office is still there, is in South Africa somewhere, habinating there. I don't know why is it habinating. Ambassador, uh, they say probably as ambassadors of Africa, I hope you are taking about it to say, why is it disappearing from the radar instead of it? Because it was a hopeful document. Every critic, every academia, every all intellectuals, civil society, they say, this is it. And then, why is it? Is it a suffering of implementation that we see in South Africa? It's all over the continent, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. So, if we could really begin to revive that, we have answers that are lying in that particular document. Uh, so, I will then say, call it as part of the solutions to achieve our goal 
of the human rights in Africa. And, 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 and then we, 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 we have now the latest innovation of the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement. Uh, but the trade will still be difficult for if roads that networks all the countries, if flying to, to Western Sahara as I did uh, two months ago, I flew to Amsterdam because there was no direct flight to, and there's not still direct flight to Western Sahara. It's coming April. Uh, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's Algeria. Yes. Yeah, Algeria is now going to be flying, and that will give us very good access to Western Sahara. <laughs> but for now, I had to go to Amsterdam, stayed about eight hours in the airport, and then connected to France to spend about seven hours. I left here on Friday, I arrived Monday morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. on my way there. <laughs> yeah. And then on the Monday when I arrived, I spoke and I left so that I can then reconnect together with my comrades that I was with there. Uh, I just spoke, I spent an hour, two hours in Western Sahara, having spent Friday, Saturday, Sunday on the road. Mm -hmm. yeah. From France, I arrived in Algeria. As, as I arrived, the flight was leaving because the French was, uh, airline was, was, was late. And I saw through the window uh, the flight going to Western Sahara leaving. They said, go and sleep at the hotel, we leave on Monday morning. <laughs> and the Monday morning is, is really, really morning. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm in another flight <laughs> to, to reach the place where I was going to. Uh, so the, 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 the goods there for if I have to sell flowers to Western Sahara, it means the flowers will first have to go to Europe before they come back to Africa. Anything I produce, uh, the train network is bad. The railway that connects Africa from south, it ends in Zambia. Uh, there's just 60 kilometers to reach Burundi, and uh, no one is investing in that. And then from the north, they all end up somewhere in Cameroon, Central Africa. is a big hole. There's never been any rail network there. So we need them to begin to connect the rail so that people and goods can move with ease. And then the roads, uh, I'm glad that the N1, uh, that, uh, uh, who is this? Uh, uh, roads, Cecil Roads built from Cape uh, to Zimbabwe where he fell and died. It was a mission for him to connect to Cairo. That's why they were calling Cape to Cairo. But he died with him somewhere in Zimbabwe. But now it has been connected to Tanzania. Now it's also moving by the new governments uh, towards uh, reaching Cairo. Uh, so, but there's a north-south link that is poor infrastructure. East-west also poor infrastructure. And there's a program called the Infrastructure Plan of the AU. That is there also. So. Uh, it will connect us uh, and make the continent one. But also the people will stand visiting each other, understand each other, know each other. Uh, probably we might even go back to the days when the continent was one. But it's a journey that we ought to travel. But there's a lot of other decisions that have been taken. One common passport for Africa is still not there. There are decisions of the AU that are there. So that I don't even have to have visas so long as the passport records I've arrived in South Africa, I've now passed to Botswana. If anything happened uh, on my journey, then they, I become one of the suspic suspects that I might have committed crime. Uh, that's what we're saying. So that no one then remains undocumented because that passport then will be an enforceable passport for all to travel and it's a visa on its own. And, and that's how you need them to begin to record. But some countries, we still need to help them with African population register. The register, they don't have. It's only you and a few others that have a, a population register. So all of us, we need them to develop. We are now going to the fourth IR, the fourth industrial revolution, where technology is easy, that these phones are in the hands of our people. Telecommunication, very weak. The cables are landing on the continent that connects west to India and Asia. They pass the continent, they land in different spots, but connectivity 
in Africa is poor. We are still not even on 5G, a majority of the countries. Very, very low in terms of the speed and, 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 and connectivity. So those are the investments that are said. They are, they are decisions. And I think the human rights can only be achieved if we implement on those things. And then we can then deal with the minimals. Uh, that will still remain as human beings. You know, we are human beings. We do wrong things all the time. And and, and therefore, that's, that will be my call on this. And, and I think I've touched Western Sahara a bit, uh, but uh, uh, the solidarity with the people of Western Sahara is what we are calling for now, as I now put the mic away from me. They are in occupied, in the, in the occupied territories. As you said, media cannot access those points. Uh, and then a the lot of them are in exile in Algeria on the border with, uh, with what is their country. And then they are in refugee camps. They don't have books, they don't have clothes, they don't have shoes, children don't have toys, children don't have things to play out with. And those human rights elements that we need to call South Africans to do, let's all donate what we no longer use package them in cargoes and go and that is international solidarity that I'm calling for. Thank you very much.